Sometimes I Never Suffered is the third part of a, I guess, pseudo epic poem. Um, I think of it as an epic, but um, there are certain traditional aspects of the epic missing from it. Um, for example, um, it's not nationalistic. There's um, no sort of central character. Um, but Sometimes I Never Suffered does feature a character that um, showed up in the first part of the poem um, that was included in my book in the language of my captor. Uh, that character's name is Jim Limber, and he's a real historical figure. Um, he was uh, a mixed race child who was sort of informally adopted by uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, um, in the last year of the Civil War. And so in, in the language of my captor, the beginning of the epic, um, he's, uh, he speaks a, a sequence of sonnets, um, and they're all him as a child, and they're all um, research-based. Whereas in um, Sometimes I Never Suffered, um, it imagines, um, the book imagines Jim Limber in heaven. Um, and so it's a sequence of sonnets spoken by Limber. Um, but, um, because the book also imagines a multiverse, um, it's, uh, that it's a multi heaven. And so every Jim Limber is technically a different speaker, but they've all had fairly similar life experiences. Um, the other, uh, speaker in the book. Um, is this character uh, called the Hastily Assembled Angel. Um, and his story, it's sort of weird to gender an angel, but I guess I always refer to him as him in the book. Uh, his story is that um, at the very beginning of the world, um, the angels um, uh, realized that God was going to send at least one of them down to earth to sort of monitor basically human beings but um, life developing on earth and then monitor history none of the angels wanted to do it and so they sort of slapped this angel together and shoved him out of heaven and this is the hastily assembled angel and so sometimes i never suffered is uh narrated um sort of alternately um by these speakers um as I said, it's the third part uh, of uh, an epic, the first and second uh, parts of which were in my previous two books, uh, beginning with uh, In the Language of My Captor. Um, that part was called Purgatory slash uh, A Son and a Father of Sons. Um, and then uh, my next book, The Gilded Auction Block, uh, featured a long narrative poem called The Hell Poem. Um, and so sometimes I never suffered. As I said, um, it's either set in heaven or it is spoken by somebody who has been to heaven. The idea is it's, um, I guess, you know, sort of obviously playing with uh, the Dante's Commedia, um, although, you know, I don't want to compare it to that work at all, um, uh, except insofar as it is playing with certain um, ideas in that work. But mine uh, starts with purgatory, um, goes to hell, and then goes to heaven. Um, I, I sort of started writing it, the whole epic, um, almost um, on accident. Um, I, I don't know what got into me the day I started writing the Hell Poem, which was the first part I started. Um, but, you know, um, over the course of several weeks, I wrote 20 or so pages of it. I got stuck because I felt like I couldn't put anybody in hell, and so I didn't know how I was going to write the poem without having people suffering. Um, the narrator could be in hell but I couldn't assign other people to hell. And so I got, I got really trapped. I didn't know what to do. Um, I ended up writing a bunch of an abandoned version of Purgatory after that. Um, but um, this sort of overlapped the development of this poem with uh, the beginning of the Trump presidency. Um, and I realized that the Trump presidency was providing me with characters that I could put in the hell part of the poem. And so that meant I could go back to the poem um, and eventually sort of take up the entire project again, which um, I had been writing anyway, sort of unconsciously. I'd moved away from the hell poem because I couldn't put anyone in hell, but then I did end up doing another group of things that became the purgatory part, um, and then I realized I had these two parts. And so even though I had started the whole project um, sort of accidentally, when I realized I had purgatory in hell, I then realized I needed 
to be purposeful about what I was going to do next and write a book about heaven. And that is how uh, Sometimes I Never Suffered um, came to be. Um, what else should I say about it? Um, it is in, in, in some formal way similar to uh, the books that came before it. Um, all of my poems are fairly strictly traditionally metrical, um, but I use that more as um, a means of sort of keeping myself in check, um, sort of keeping myself focused when I'm writing. Um, I try to write metrical poems that aren't necessarily obviously metrical. Um, I want um, the reader to not necessarily concentrate on that. Um, it can sometimes be distracting if you're thinking about, um, particularly if a poem is using sort of traditional meter and rhyme, that can sometimes be distracting for the reader, at least nowadays. Um, and so um, I try not to make that um, sort of stick out. Um, but uh, Sometimes I Never Suffer does resemble my other books formally. I utilize, as I said, traditional meter, but I also utilize a lot of um, repetition. Um, there's a lot of sound play going on in there. Um, the use of repetition and sound play, etc., um, the way that I use them is meant to, to some extent, uh, distract the reader from what's going on metrically. Um, it's, 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 it's a technique um, to achieve the goal that I previously mentioned of having them not necessarily focus um, on what's going on uh, formally. Um, there is an exception to, uh, well, I should also add that there's generally no punctuation, but there's an exception to this idea that there's no punctuation in that um, in the middle of the book, there's a, a long verse drama. Well, okay, it's not that long. <laughs> it's like eight pages long, but it's, uh, it, it's long for me. Um, it felt long, at least. Uh, it's really only like one act. Um, but it felt like I couldn't really control how the voices were going to sound or make it apparent how I wanted them to sound if I didn't use punctuation. And so, although it is still metrical, um, that uh, drama involves punctuation to help people who want to sort of read it like a play in their heads, um, to sort of help guide them with regard to how it's going to sound. Um, but um, I think uh, something that I'm realizing about this book that I, I, I found kind of strange. Um, when I started writing it, I thought, well, I've been writing very heavily political books and I'm going to, you know, relax. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm going to, you know, just chill out and write this book that's more about, you know, I'm going to foreground aesthetics in this way that I haven't necessarily done since my first book. And uh, I didn't really realize that it was ending up um, as political as any of my other books. Um, I just wasn't thinking about it, um, but I, I can't help but write about um, racism in America, race relations in America, class relations in America, and just Americanness, and it's sort of inevitably political. <laughs>